Okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Victor Zavala. He's the Richard Soit uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And before uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, he was a computational mathematician in, uh, at Argonne National Lab. Um, he has his PhD from Carnegie Mellon, and he's currently the Department of Energy Early Career Award a recipient in which he develops scalable optimization algorithms. He's on the editorial board of the Journal of Process Control and Mathematical Programming Computation, and his research interests are in the areas of mathematical modeling of energy systems, high performance computing, stochastic optimization, and predictive control. And I just got to say, it's been a pleasure to, uh, when I was at ExxonMobil, that we had Victor there. Uh, working on his PhD and working with us, and it was a pleasure to have him there. Uh, he brought a lot of innovation to the group, and so I've, I've been really pleased to be able to, to have been able to interact with him in the past, and now again today to see some of his innovations. So, uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Victor for his presentation. Okay, so uh, well, thank you very much for uh, setting this up on us. Uh, uh, this is a great pleasure to be giving this talk. I'm, I'm happy to see some. Uh, uh, familiar people in the uh, listening to this and also some new people. Um, so this is a talk that I actually gave uh, on the occasion of uh, Larry uh, Bigler's uh, 60th birthday last year in uh, AICHE. Uh, this is working in a collaboration with uh, people from United Technologies, in particular Nayuan Chang and Roy Huang. Uh, one of the reasons why I bring uh, uh, Larry in the conversation is that because uh, when I started my uh, research career, I was uh, very excited about this idea of always trying to solve bigger and bigger optimization problems, large scale, large scale optimization. And that really my, set my brain into uh, thinking about uh, how do you solve uh, optimization problems. Uh, but lately, uh, through the work of many, many people that I will be doing at the service, just uh, trying to mention all of them, but. Uh, I'm going to try to bring uh, some no names up. Uh, uh, Professor Morari is in the audience. So, um, through, uh, throughout the years, people have recognized that there are also a range of applications that they really need uh, us to think about in a different way. Uh, ex essentially, trying to think about how do we solve optimization problems when you actually have uh, constrained uh, resources um, in terms of memory, uh, speed and just uh, low cost and gen in general computing processors. Um, so this uh, brings up uh, topics like uh, embedded optimization and things like that. So uh, Professor Morari, Manfred, uh, um, Moritz Steele, Alberto Benporat, and uh, Francesco Borelli have been very active in this area. So it's a very, very interesting field. Okay, so why don't I just get started? And let me just... Uh, so uh, from my perspective uh, and some of the perspectives that I've been hearing from industry, uh, we're moving nowadays into a new era where we're trying to put more uh, devices, uh, what people in industry are calling as smart devices. We're trying to embed more decision-making capability into devices that traditionally were very passive. Right, so uh, in this graph what I'm showing um, uh, what I'm showing you is uh, the number of expected devices that are going to be connected to the internet uh, over over the years. So you are seeing here that in around uh, year 2020, people are projecting that we're going to have over 50 billion devices uh, that could be connected to the cloud and be performing uh, some sort of decision-making capability. Um, so right now, one of the big applications, for example, is in buildings, the smart thermostats with the introduction of the Nest thermostat. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, uh, people are excited about. Uh, but these devices are, are, are essentially everywhere in healthcare applications, uh, smart homes, uh, all, all over the place. Um, so, um, so one of the um, interesting things about this is that uh, computing processors, if you look at the last uh, uh, 10 years, so here is a plot that I got from The, the Economist. Uh, where essentially Moore's law is still alive in the sense that we're still being able to put more and more uh, 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 chips in the in the transistors, so so we're still able to scale things up. But if, what is interesting is the, the the clock speeds that we have been achieving. So if you look at the clock speed of your processor that you have on your laptop, it hasn't really changed that much in the last 10 years. 
Uh, so what this means from an optimization standpoint is that um, any future advances uh, in trying to solve these problems uh, faster and also more reliably will, uh, will come from two, two things. One is our ability, natural ability, to keep improving the algorithms, but the other one is to have the ability to tailor the algorithms to particularly computing uh, platforms. So what we're seeing nowadays is that the processors are not getting faster, but they're becoming cheaper. So now we can just install things like a Raspberry Pi, very, very cheap computing platform everywhere, and we can have the Raspberry Pi uh, uh, perform functions, right, uh, on anything that we ever wanted. So, um, so this is an interesting trend that, that, that we're seeing. Uh, people are very interested in, in just putting more advanced control and uh, uh, data processing and estimation techniques embedded directly in devices like valves, uh, as I said, thermostats, actuators, and things like that. Right? So that's one of the trends. So, so this, uh, at least for me personally, this was something that, that really changed uh, a little bit the perception that I have about optimization. So there are two philosophies. The way I think about this, there are two philosophies in the way that we can uh, go around designing optimization algorithms. Um, the traditional approach, I would say, the ones that we're familiar with in industry, is that we really want to tackle larger problems. Uh, most of the time when we de develop these algorithms, we really don't think about any constraints in the computing resources. What we just want to say is say, look, based on the fastest computer that we have right now, let's just try to push the algorithm to use uh, as, as, um, to be able to solve the biggest problem that we can, right? But we really never involve the computing constraints in the algorithmic design. And that's very, very important. So we're not thinking about those constraints when we are actually uh, are trying to develop some new mathematics or new algorithmic implementations. The second philosophy I'm showing here on the right, and it's precisely uh, the other idea that is to say, well, we also want to tackle larger problems, but we want to do it in a way that we actually think about the constraints that we have in the computing, uh, uh, in the computing environment. So we need to think about how much power is available for this uh, computing device. Uh, think about your iPhone or just a thermostat that we might be uh, just plugging on the wall. Um, uh, also, what is the computing speed that you're going to be able to uh, use for this processor? Because these processors tend to be cheap, you're also not going to be getting the, probably the speed that you'll be able to get uh, in your laptop or in a, on a desktop. right? So, so maybe this is going to be a device that, that has some very in inherent uh, constraints into in how much computing it can do, and the other one is the train memory because also of the of the of the cost. Um, we're also probably going to be start hitting some constraints on memory, right? So, so as I mentioned before, so that's uh, some of the industrial trends that we're seeing is precisely uh, towards the second philosophy: is how do we uh, have low-cost devices? being able to increase functionality, right? How can we have them run MPC, for example, or real-time optimization, uh, do data processing, machine learning. So if you're going to be doing machine learning or data simulation, you're going to be need, needing to solve uh, optimization problems in real time at that level, right? So just thinking about how the Nest does it, for example, that's uh, a way of thinking about it. Um, um, uh, the other thing that is interesting is that uh, another thing that industry is excited about, about pushing this functionality to the devices, is that now they can reduce the amount of centralization on data. And this in, in, introduces an interesting paradigm into how much data processing we, we want to do at the devices level and how much data we actually want to uh, put into centralized computing systems, right? So, so that is also creating some interesting uh, observations that, uh, that that is important to think about. Um, the other important, another important thing is that even the fastest computers in the world right now. So, when I was uh, at Argon, uh, for example, uh, we had Blue Jean, we have Blue Jean P, Blue, we have Blue Jean Q. Right now, we're building Aurora. So, you might think, well, these are computers that are super fast and they can solve very large problems. But if you actually think about how these computers work they're actually comprised of a very, very large set of low-cost processors. So the fastest computer in the world right now, what, what they are doing is actually not putting the most cutting-edge computing processors in each, in each one of the, of the machines, on each one of the um, uh, racks, but essentially what they want is to have also low-cost processors, but a lot, a lot of them, 
right? So the same types of issues that you're running into in the in the second philosophy are also showing in high performance computing. And this is also driven by this idea that the computer processors are not getting much faster anymore. So we're in the era with uh, having more processors is becoming uh, a probably a better uh, uh, strategy. All right. Okay, so what does this mean from a from an algorithmic standpoint, right? So, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about right now is um, one particular story, but there are several stories around. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit my uh, particular story on how do you use interior point methods uh, uh, for nonlinear programming, and how do you need to rethink the algorithmic design if you want to solve an optimization problem that might look very innocent. Uh, on your laptop, but if you want to solve it on an embedded processor, you're going to start opening a can of worms, and you really need to think about how you're going to redesign the algorithm and how you also actually, in particular, do the linear algebra. So everything boils down, in a lot of cases, to linear algebra. Uh, I'm saying that this is just a particular story because there are many stories. Um, there's a lot of activity in the field. Uh, people are interested in not only using interior point methods, but they're also uh, interested in, in solving problems with fast gradient methods, uh, uh, with all sorts of projection techniques, in just trying to bring down the complexity. So the perspective that I have here is from the perspective of interior point, but there are a lot of stories around in the literature, and I'll be happy to point you to some papers if you're interested in this. Okay, so the basic essence of a, an interior point method is that we want to treat inequalities directly uh, using a smooth reformulation of the problem. By smoothing out the, the problem using something like a barrier, a logarithmic barrier term, uh, we're able to use traditional techniques, uh, uh, derivative free, uh, I'm sorry, derivative based optimization techniques like Newton's method. So ultimately, what we want is to solve an optimization problem that is potentially highly nonlinear, and we're going to apply some uh, version of Newton's method. So in order to do that, what we do is to apply a linearization of the optimality conditions of this problem. And this gives you a, a linear system, which traditionally is a sparse linear system. Um, here on the right-hand side, what I'm showing you is precisely the optimality conditions of the problem evaluated at the current iteration. So this is the gradient of the Lagrangian. And these are the constraints, C of x. Um, the Newton step is given by the Newton step B. That is the step for the primal variables, for the variables x. And P is the step for the dual variables, for the Lagrange multipliers. In this case, I'm denoting those as Y. Um, the matrix that I normally call the KKT matrix, some people also call it the augmented matrix, it is a, a, a linear, it's a, it's a matrix, it's a linear, it's a, it's a linear system. It is composed of the Hessian of the Lagrangian. It's essentially the matrix of second derivatives. And you also have the Jacobian of the constraints. So here you have Jacobian transpose, and here you have the Jacobian of the constraints. So the second row in this system is essentially the linearization of the constraints around the current iteration. And the first row is the linearization of the, Lagrange, the gradient of the Lagrangian at the current iteration. Okay. Now, what is nice about interior point methods is that the structure of this linear system, uh, the sparsity structure, does not change from iteration to iteration. And this is a very big um, uh, benefit of interior point methods compared to other strategies uh, that are de uh, de uh, derivative-based, and particularly when you use second-order derivatives. Um, so one of the things is that if the structure of the linear algebra does not change, you can customize linear algebra. So you can be very smart about how you implement your linear algebra in the device, and that becomes very, very important to do at the device level. Um, the other thing is that it also enables you to implement some very advanced uh, globalization strategies. So for people that are not familiar with NLP, here by globalization, what we mean is the ability of the solver to converge uh, to a stationary point from a wide range of, solu um, of initial points. So it is very, very important that we uh, actually can solve these problems from remote starting points, right? We want these things to be robust, and particularly if they're going to be doing feedback control and things like that, right? Um, there are a lot of applications for interior point methods that we have seen in the past, right? DOE constraint, dynamic optimization, PD constraint optimization, model predictive control, moving horizon estimation, you name it. There are a lot of, lot of applications. There are a lot of codes around. And, and here what I want to make a distinction is that there are codes that have been designed for solving problems and on, on desktop. 
right? So that causes like IPO, contain nitro, and OQP that have been designed uh, precisely to solve problems that are very large. But now there's a new family of solvers that we're seeing coming uh, online right now, or you want to call it online, or coming out. Uh, for example, one of them is forces that actually comes out of uh, Professor Morari's group. Uh, where well, essentially the idea with these solvers is that you really want to think about how you implement uh, the algorithm and the linear algebra together in a way that they can exploit uh, computing platforms. So, so you are starting to see the emergence of solvers that are also tailored, in particular, for uh, um, uh, computing applications like an embedded system that I'm pointing here. All right. So what we wanted to do is precisely try to see if we wanted to re if we wanted to re-engineer IPOPT, which is one of the solvers that have been very popular in solving some of these problems, if we could do some re-engineering of the linear algebra uh, in order to enable implementations in in, in uh, embedded platforms. So as I mentioned, IPOPT is really designed as a solver to solve very large problems. So now the idea is, okay, can we do it actually uh, also help the solver to be used to uh, uh, for embedded uh, computing devices? Okay. Now, at the at the core of IPOPT, it is a, a numerical uh, linear algebra system that we need to solve. As I mentioned, this comes from applying Newton's method to the stationarity conditions. So, um, so as I, I already described the different um, elements of this linear algebra system, two things that I want to mention in here in particular is that one of the reasons why IPOPT is super robust is it uses a very smart regularization technique uh, for the primal variables uh, introduced through this parameter delta w, and for the constraints that is uh, implicit in this parameter uh, uh, delta c. Um, these two regularization parameters are actually critical to enable the solver, and I'll explain more details later on, but they're critical to enable that the, that the solver behaves robustly. Uh, in particular, the first parameter allows you to account for situations in which at a particular iterate you are sitting in a region where you have non-convexity. Uh, when you have non-convexity locally in that region, the Newton step that you compute by solving this system, you can actually you cannot uh, guarantee that it's a descent direction for uh, the objective function. So what ends up happening is that if, if there's non-convexity, if there's negative curvature, we call it negative curvature, one of the eigenvalues might be negative, um, uh, the Newton step will point you in the wrong direction and might be actually taking you to maximizing the objective instead of minimizing. So it is very important for us to monitor that there are no negative eigenvalues in this system and, and regularize the system whenever we encounter uh, that. Uh, the second parameter is also super relevant because when you have highly nonlinear systems, uh, the constraints sometimes, uh, when you linearize the constraints, um, you might have a rank deficiency in the Jacobian. So the, uh, a, set of, a set of constraints, when you linearize them, might become very, very close uh, to being linearly dependent. And if they're linearly dependent, uh, then what happens is that this uh, matrix becomes singular, and you cannot compute the Newton step. So you have a, a rank deficiency there. Um, so what we do is actually to regularize this uh, corner over here, precisely trying to correct for that. And, uh, and, and that will enable us to, uh, to compute the Newton step. So these are two features uh, of IPOP that, that make it very, very uh, um, uh, robust. Okay, now the solution of this linear system is by far the limiting step in the algorithm. Uh, and this has implications in uh, not only in how fast you can solve the, the problem, but also in how much memory you're gonna need to solve uh, this problem. And normally we don't think about memory when we're working on our laptop because normally we have a lot of memory available. But again, if we're going into embedded devices, memory becomes very important, okay? Okay, so right now the way you solve um, the linear algebra system in IPOP is by applying something that is called a symmetric indefinite factorization. So essentially what this does is decompose, it, uh, this decomposes the matrix K, so this big sparse matrix into three matrices, which is essentially a low, uh, lower triangular matrix L, a, a block, uh, this is a block, nearly block diagonal, um, or purely diagonal matrix, it's a block diagonal matrix B, 
and L transpose, which is just the transpose of this uh, L matrix. Okay, so this matrix B has the key property that is almost diagonal. So essentially it has entries that are one by one, but it also has entries that are two by two. So there are some very little blocks that have two by two entries in there, okay? Um, this is important because it turns out that the number of eigenvalues, number of positive and negative eigenvalues of this matrix B is actually the number of positive and negative eigenvalues of the matrix K. So you can actually prove that. Um, so that is important because precisely when we're identifying if we need to regularize this matrix, precisely what we do is trying to count the number of positive and negative eigenvalues of this matrix B. What is interesting about this is that you never compute the eigenvalues themselves. Uh, because in some of these applications, you cannot compute eigenvalues, it's too expensive. But all that you need is not the eigenvalues, all that you need is just the count of positive and negative. That's all that you need, and that's what you can do uh, through this matrix B. Okay. Um, traditionally, the way you factorize this matrix is by using some very advanced codes, uh, uh, codes like Pardiso, MA27, MA57. These are codes that are commercial, so you need to pay a license for them. If you're an academic, you can get away getting a, a free license. That's great. But for people that are in industry, this actually can represent an important cost. Because when you're trying to embed, let's say, IP opt in an, in an embedded system, you will need to be solving this thing using a license coming from these in algebra uh, systems, right? So this could be a, an expensive license to, to have. So even if IP opt is open source, the linear algebra might not be open source. There are some tools for doing linear algebra with open source tools, uh, um, and I'll explain that in a second, uh, but that's just important to, to bring it up, that uh, some of these commercial tools that we have for linear algebra are very efficient, but they also cost a lot of, can cost a lot of money, okay? And this is where um, new open source tools uh, become very, very important, okay? Um, all right, so one of the key observations in our context is that uh, this factorization of this matrix, uh, as I told you, is the, the most limiting effect. Um, but um, one of the important things is that this is very efficient. It can be done very effectively with these codes, but it also involves very high overheads. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, intelligence embedded in these uh, linear algebra systems that involves a lot of overhead. And these overheads start um, uh, becoming very taxing as you, uh, when you have very small systems. So when you have very large systems, you don't see them. But when you have very low systems, uh, when you have very low complexity problems, uh, you are paying the price of this overhead without actually needing it, right? So probably the take-home uh, take message here is just a way to think about it is that if you have a problem that you're going to be solving on a computing uh, platform that is small, you really don't want to kill that fly with a machine gun, right? So you want to. Uh, use probably something that is less com uh, less complex than these very, very advanced uh, software tools that we have available. Okay, so this is probably a little bit too much math to digest in a, in a slide, so I'm going to go a little slow here and just uh, try to point you to the, to the, to the main uh, aspects of the problem. Um, so another reason why I'd IP up, uh, is there any question? Oh, Any sorry, questions? somebody just joined, uh, uh, there's a little bit of feedback. Go anyway. ahead. Uh, by the way, anyone feel free to interrupt me uh, if uh, if you have any comments or questions, and I'll be happy to uh, clarify. So um, uh, so another feature of IPO, one is the linear algebra, and the interesting thing is that the linear algebra is tightly connected to what we call the globalization uh, strategy. And let me explain what is a globalization strategy in a, in a nutshell, okay? The fundamental issue in optimization is that you want to minimize an objective function while minimizing the constraint violation at the same time, right? So at a solution of the problem, you want that the objective function that I'm here defining as uh, bar phi x, uh, you want to minimize that, but at the same time, you want that the constraints are zero, right? That, they, that, they, that they're satisfied, right? So, so essentially, you can think about this as trying to minimize the constraint violation like the norm of the constraints, and at the same time minimize the objective function. Now, when you compute a Newton step, you cannot guarantee that that um, you're going to minimize one or the other. You need to be very careful, 
right? Because the Newton step either might be reducing the objective function or we might be reducing the constraints, but, but it's very unlikely that it's going to minimize both of them at the same time, okay? So, or, or it's going to reduce them at the same time. So, um, so the the key idea here that uh, in IP Optics uses the concept of the filter. Uh, so, in the concept of the filter, what you want is precisely try to track if the Newton step is actually improving either the constraint violation of the of the objective function. Okay. So, the way that is this is done, and let me show you this figure over here, is that you keep track of all the iterates and try to see if in, in, if in a current iteration you are decreasing the objective function or you are decreasing the constraint. So if you are decreasing the constraint, you are moving in the direction to the left. If you are decreasing the uh, objective, you are moving down, okay? So you keep track of these iterates. So whenever you take a new Newton step, you want to make sure that that new iteration that you are about to accept or reject uh, is below this uh, uh, parade of front. It's essentially a parade of front. It's below this parade of curve, and um, uh, and otherwise you don't accept the step. If 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 it and and the key idea is that the Newton step needs to either decrease the constraint violation or it needs to decrease the objective function. But at least one of them has to uh, has to be satisfied. Okay, so so that's the key idea of the filter. We keep track of these things and we make sure that these things are, are actually. Um, uh, working and progressing as we expect. Traditionally, what you see in practice is that the solver will have the tendency, and I'll explain in a second why that is the case, will have the tendency to first reduce the constraint violation. So it's going to get you very, very close to try to uh, close the constraint violation. And once you're very close to a certain threshold, uh, the solver is going to try to start improving now the objective function. Right? So, so that's traditionally what you see in practice. The reason why you traditionally start uh, decreasing the constraint violation is because what you can guarantee, and here I'm showing those, uh, showing it here in the bottom, what you can guarantee is that the Newton step turns out that it is always a descent direction for the constraint violation when this regularization term that I showed you before is zero. Okay, so that is an interesting observation. So if this regularization term is zero, or it's very very small, traditionally one to the minus eleven or minus 10, that's what in IPO you use, the Newton step is actually always decreasing the constraint violation, all right? But what is interesting is that the Newton step not always decreases the objective function, right? But what you can actually show is that the Newton step eventually will dis, um, uh, decrease the objective function uh, when this regularization term is positive or when you're locally convex and if the constraint violation is sufficiently small, right? So let me just go back one slide. So when this uh, regularization term is either positive of the Hessian of the Lagrangian projected on the Jacobians, I don't have time to explain uh, that particular term, but when they think about just the Hessian being positive definite, um, when that is the case, the Newton step actually will be a descent direction also to the, for the objective function, provided the constraint violation is sufficiently small. Right, so that is a guarantee, and those two properties are essential to guarantee global convergence. So if you don't satisfy these properties, you cannot guarantee that the solver uh, works. Okay, so so essentially that's how the uh, IP opt um, uh, operates. So again, just in summary, so what we do is we compute the Newton step uh, dk, and then we're going to be computing some trial iterates that I'm defining here as xk as a function of my step size alpha, and we're going to be moving into a new iterate uh, starting from xk uh, based on this direction. So the first condition that we check, just to summarize what I explained before, is that we want to make sure that this current iterate is not contained inside the Pareto front, in the Pareto set. So we want to ensure that either it moves in one direction or the other direction. It's improving either or both, but it's not contained in here, okay? Now, what we check is if the if the if the Newton step is actually giving you an improvement in the objective function, which is uh, monitored through this model of the objective function, it's a linearization of the objective function. Uh, so if we are actually moving in a, in the correct direction, then we actually perform an, an Armijo line search. So we try to minimize, reduce the objective function as much as we can in that direction. But if the objective function is not being improved, then we need to 
guarantee that at least the constraint violation is being improved or the objective function is being improved um, uh, based on a certain fraction of the constraint violation. This is a little too technical, but just think about it that either you want to decrease the objective function or you want to decrease uh, the constraint violation, okay? So what I want to highlight in this slide is that there's some very close interactions between uh, the regularization terms and the performance of the solver. And this is going to become important next. Um, just to summarize, if you don't regularize in the primal space, then you cannot necessarily guarantee that you are going to get a decrease, uh, um, uh, a descent direction for the objective. And if you regularize the constraints, and this is not sufficiently small, you're going to get a Newton step that does not provide a descent direction for the constraint violation. Okay. All right. So now this becomes relevant when we want to reformulate the linear algebra system. So what we want is to reformulate the linear algebra in a smart way that is going to enable us to perform this linear algebra in embedded uh, computing devices. And the secret sauce here is to notice that this augmented uh, system uh, can actually be reformulated into some form that we call an augmented Lagrangian form, which is essentially use a block elimination of this, uh, of this system. Um, so you apply a sure complement uh, method here. So the key idea is you form the sure complement in the space of the primal variables and you form this matrix that is the sure complement matrix. So you see that you have the Hessian, you have this regularization term, and now you have this product of the Jacobians. Okay? So this is the sure complement. This is the step for the primal variables. And what is interesting is that when you get, uh, when you apply the sure complement, it turns out that the right-hand side of this sure complement system becomes the gradient of the augmented Lagrangian. Okay? Um, so, so that is just an, an important property. Um, the other thing is um, the second row now becomes trivial to solve because essentially you have eliminated the primal step and the dual step is just a very simple calculation. Essentially, once you have computed dk, all that you need to compute dk is multiply this times this delta kc, right? So that, that's the, the key idea. So what is attractive about the mental Lagrangian uh, form is that um, what is uh, interesting about the augmented Lagrangian form is that the step that you compute for the primal variables, um, the, the Newton system that you solve, is now in the space only of the primal variables. So this system is significantly smaller uh, than the original system. This system operates in the primal and dual space. And then the step that you compute for the dual variables is trivial. You don't even have to compute any calculations. It's trivial, very easy to do. Now, the reason why we can actually do this sure decomposition is because we regularize precisely this uh, matrix. If you don't regularize, uh, in particular, this uh, uh, corner over here, if you don't have this regularization, then you cannot invert this block, and then you cannot form the sure complement. So the idea here is that we want to maintain this regularization there all the time, and that is going to allow us to reformulate the system in a sure in the sure form. Okay. So as I mentioned, now the right-hand side of this system becomes the gradient of the augmented Lagrangian. And what is interesting now is that um, the augmented Lagrangian is essentially the Lagrangian of the, is essentially the objective function, the constraints, and the multipliers. But you also incorporate now the constraint violation metric. Remember that this there is actually the norm of the constraints. Okay, so what is very, very nice about the mental Lagrangian is that it implicitly captures uh, the objective function and the constraints at the same time. Okay, and that, that is a, a very important uh, observation. Okay, so um, okay, so I'll explain in a second why this is uh, relevant from a convergence standpoint. Uh, but before doing that, uh, one of the things that I already mentioned is that now the only thing that we need to do is to factorize the sure uh, complement matrix, which is only in the primal space. Uh, the step for the dual is pr trivial. We can choose these regularization terms to make the sure complement positive definite, and that is very important. Now, remember, in, 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 and I don't think I mentioned this, but uh, this matrix um, is actually indefinite. It has positive and negative eigenvalues. And one of the reasons why you need very sophisticated linear algebra is precisely 
you're factorizing a matrix that it has positive and negative eigenvalues. That is very complicated to do. Uh, but when we apply this reformulation, now we have this matrix that is positive definite. And if it is positive definite, it only has positive eigenvalues. And now you can use techniques like Cholesky decomposition or preconditioned conjugate gradients that are actually very easy to implement in, uh, in particularly in low cost devices. Uh, in particular, Cholesky is almost like a direct formula. You don't have to do anything very smart. You can just like a, apply direct, uh, a direct formula to, uh, to do it, okay? So this is one of the benefits of reformulating the linear algebra. And now your, your iteration matrix becomes positive definite, and that enables you to do a lot of things, okay? Now, so the question is, can this reformulation actually guarantee uh, convergence? And the answer is yes, but there's some subtlety here. Uh, one of the kind of worms that we opened when we were uh, working on this is the fact that we actually discovered that you cannot prove that IP up converges when you have a regularization on this block. So the way that IP up works is that right now uh, we're using kind of an ad hoc heuristic that sets this regularization value to a very, very small value. So I, I was telling you this was like 1 to the minus 11. So in IP up, that's the default, 1 to the minus 11, very, very small value. So from a practical perspective, it actually works. Uh, from a practical perspective, it, it's fine. It's all, all okay. From a theoretical perspective, it actually, uh, you cannot justify that the algorithm will actually converge. And what is more relevant in our context is that uh, one of the questions is, okay, why does it have to be 1 to the minus 11? Why not 1 to the minus 6? Can we identify what is the optimal threshold? Can we identify if it can be 1 to the minus 3? Uh, what will be the implications of that and, and all sorts of things, right? So you want to open up a little bit that, that theoretical question. Use that value and we don't use any other value, right? So, so for, in order to answer those questions, we needed to rethink about how um, uh, IPOP is actually operating in the, in the convergence uh, algorithm, in the, in the globalization algorithm. So what we did was actually uh, construct a new type of filter Instead of having the constraint violation and the objective function, as I showed you before, now we have the constraint violation and the augmented Lagrangian. And this is going to give you some uh, interesting properties, right? Uh, but precisely the observation, as I showed you before, is that when you compute the Newton step using our reformulation, the, the right-hand side of the linear system is actually the gradient of the Lagrangian. So what that indicates is that that Newton step is actually a descent direction for uh, the augmented Lagrangian, okay? Uh, so that is one of the motivations for that, that, that that Newton step can actually be guaranteed to be a descent direction for the augmented Lagrangian. So that, that is uh, the key idea. So the filter follows pretty much as, as before, but now with the observation that we're now trading off the augmented Lagrangian and the constraint violation together. And the key observation is, as I told you, the Newton step is a descent direction for the augmented Lagrangian for some value of this regularization parameter or when it is locally convex. And uh, the Newton step is also a uh, descent for the constraint violation for a sufficiently small value of this regularization parameter. Uh, but a, an interesting observation, and, and don't pay too much attention to all this math, but I just want to highlight what is in the boxes. Um, an interesting observation is that when we put the augmented Lagrangian metric, turns out that the Newton step be becomes a productive step, it decreases the mental Lagrangian more often than what it decreases the objective function. And one way of seeing this is by comparing these two equations. So let me compare what happens when the filter is the new filter that I'm showing you, uh, the constraint violation and the mental Lagrangian. And let's compare what happens when the filter is the constraint violation and the objective function. Okay. Okay, so if I take the Newton step transpose the gradient of the Lagrangian, if I want the augmented Lagrangian, I'm sorry, the augmented Lagrangian, when the inner product of these vectors is negative, that means that the augmented Lagrangian is a descent, uh, that, that the Newton step is a descent direction for the augmented Lagrangian, right? When the inner product of this is negative. That's precisely what we want. So precisely when you work out the, the, the algebra here, what ends up happening is that this inner product is essentially this inner outer product with the Hessian, so this term you can make uh, positive, which means that this term is actually always negative. 
So this is less than zero, which is what we want. This inner product is positive, and this is negative, and this term is positive, right? This regularization term is positive. So this full term over here is also negative, right? So these two terms actually are always negative regardless of anything. So that is very nice. Uh, the third term is the one that gives you trouble. The third term multiplies is an inner product of the of the step for the multipliers and of the constraint violation. But this term, this inner product can be positive or can be negative. And this is the one that gives you trouble. And this explains why you cannot always guarantee that the Newton step is always a descent direction precisely because of this. Now, when the constraints are sufficiently small, uh, uh, you can actually show that when this CK, the constraints essentially, are sufficiently small, this term will become irrelevant, right? So if this becomes irrelevant, then these terms start dominating, and you always guarantee that you have a descent direction, okay? So that is precisely one of the reasons why what you see in IP opt is that it's going to tend to decrease the constraint violation first, and then start improving the objective function, because precisely first what you want is to decrease this constraint violation as fast as you can, right? And this explains why you cannot guarantee that the descent uh, happens all the time, okay? So now, that is for the aumented Lagrangian. Now, what happens for the constraints? So now, if, if I take the inner product of my Newton step and of the gradient of the objective function, that is g, you get a very similar expression. So you see these two expressions are the same. These two expressions are the same. These two are the same. But now you introduce this parasitic term. And what is interesting about this is that this term, turns out that it goes to zero, right, as the constraints uh, become uh, uh, satisfied. But this term over here remains unbounded. This term, you cannot put a bound as a function of the constraints. So what this means is that this term over here might never die off. Yeah, it's, a, it's a persisting parasitic term that you might actually never guarantee that it actually uh, vanishes. And this is actually bad news. And this is one of the reasons why in IP op, you need to keep this parameter to 1 to the minus 11 so that this term becomes irrelevant. Because if, if this is very large, then you won't be able to actually guarantee that this term um, is actually sufficiently small and you won't be able to see progress. But this explains why precisely you need to keep this parameter uh, very, very small. All right? So the main observation that I have here is that the change of the filter metric actually matters. Uh, so if you use the, instead of the objective function, you use the aumented Lagrangian, it actually helps you. Because what is going to happen is that the constraint, uh, um, you're going to see that this parasitic term disappears. So you're not going to have that issue. You're going to be able to regularize with a larger set of parameters. And you won't be seeing all the convergence issues that you might be seeing in this space. Um, this is another term, it doesn't matter too much. And um, these conditions also tell you that the ratio of this parameter of the aumented Lagrangian kappa and, and the, and the, and the um, parameter that we're regularizing with uh, has to be kept small. So this analysis gives you also the idea that this ratio over here has to be kept small whenever possible. Um, now the constraints eventually will vanish, but you want this uh, ratio to be uh, sufficiently small, and I'm going to show you next in uh, in some numerical experiments that this actually plays out to be important, right? Uh, but this gives you some guidelines as to how to pick uh, these regularization terms. Okay, all right. So now let's move to an uh, of Well, before that, okay. So turns out that the the algorithm convergence. I'm not going to go into this uh, in, into these details. If you guys are interested, I'll be happy to share the slides with you. Um, the main result is that the algorithm is globally convergent uh, when you put the aumented Lagrangian there, and if you regularize this thing, uh, you're going to be computing the Newton steps using the sure complement instead of the full uh, symmetric indefinite factorization. So this is nice because you are not destroying the convergence properties of IP opt, but you are doing these things in a way that the linear algebra is more flexible, and that is going to be helpful uh, for us in the in the in the, in a, from a computing standpoint. Okay, so this is an interesting application that actually United Technologies was the company that actually got me into this. So Rui Huang, 
approached me at some point and he said, look, we have this application where we cannot solve this problem with IP opt on an embedded platform. It's getting too expensive. So can you help us reformulate some of this uh, linear algebra? So these are very interesting applications. So uh, if you guys think in commercial buildings, uh, big commercial buildings are designed by having multiple air handling units that are essentially taking air from outside, from the outside, and also from the recycle in the system. And the air handling unit is precisely taking the air in and it is conditioning it, um, uh, decreasing the temperature or increasing the temperature depending on if you're in heating or cooling mode. And then the air handling unit is distributing air, so it is uh, allocating resources for something that is called a variable air volume box. These variable air volume boxes are, are sitting um, uh, on your damper uh, for the guys that are sitting in an office right now. So you're having a variable air volume box uh, sitting on your damper. So your thermostat is talking to that variable air volume box. So whenever you guys come into your office, the thermostat is um, implicitly sensing that through the increase in the temperature, right? And it's sending the control signal uh, to the um, uh, to the to the volume box. Now, so what is interesting about this is that in a big building, you have a lot of these little boxes, and these little boxes are all requesting air at the same time to the air handling unit. So the air handling unit, what it needs to decide is how how does it prioritize sending the air to these multiple units in a way that it can save energy, right? So you need to be careful to save energy to keep the balance of the flow in the system because uh, uh, if you start uh, doing weird allocations of air, then you can also have pressure issues and things like that. So this system is actually has to be very smart into how does it allocate the, uh, the air to the, the multiple air, uh, uh, variable air volume boxes, all right? So let me move a little bit faster. Um, so the way that it does, does this is a resource allocation problem, so this is a nonlinear optimization problem. And now the secret is that it needs to solve it very, very fast because these things are actually solving very, very fast. Uh, there are two, uh, two nonlinear programs uh, that we solve. One that is actually very small, uh, 22 variables and 43 constraints, and one that I am going to put in quotes, large NLP, which is 1,000 variables and, and, and almost 1,000 constraints. Now, you guys might be asking, well, nowadays we can solve problems with 100,000 variables with IP up, right? Now, remember that that can be done in a, in a workstation, right? But you cannot do that in an air handling unit, right, when you're going to have a low-cost embedded processors. And I'm actually going to show you that just this very innocent-looking NLP can give a lot of trouble to IP up when you are running on a very constrained uh, computing environment. Okay, so you have these two computing systems that we're going to compare. This is a processor that is sitting on a standard workstation, and we use an embedded system that is called a Beagle Bone Black. So it's a, and what is remarkable about this system is that it has only 500 mega, megabytes of memory available, so it's very constrained in memory, and it has one uh, gigahertz of, uh, of speed, okay? All right, so these are some results for solving the um, uh, one of the NLP instances that I show you. And here what I want to show you, this is the number of iterations that it takes the solver uh, to solve the problem. As we change this parameter, the regularization parameter for the Jacobian and the, and the, and the parameter for the mental Lagrangian, okay? So what you're going to see is that there's a wide range of parameter combinations that actually achieve convergence. What is remarkable is that you can achieve faster convergence than IP opt. So IP opt requires 49 iterations to solve. In all these cases, we're achieving less iterations than IP opt. And again, this is because we can accept steps more often. Uh, by, changing the mental Lagrangian instead, by putting the mental Lagrangian instead of the objective function, we can actually accept more steps, right? So that brings uh, some capabilities. Now, this table is also telling you the limits uh, of what IP opt or any solver that is using these uh, techniques uh, uh, what are the limits in the parameters? So what is interesting is that IP opt is using as default this parameter, 1 to the minus 11, and you might say, well, if I keep making this smaller and smaller, maybe it's getting better and better. Uh, so in the case of IP opt, that is true, but in our algorithm, that is not true. As this thing keeps getting uh, uh, smaller and smaller, what happens is that um, the sure complement has the reciprocal of this parameter. So if it has the reciprocal of the parameter, this you're going to introduce an entry that is 
is 1 to the 14, right? So this tells you that our algorithm actually doesn't benefit from having this smaller and smaller, but actually has to have some part, some recent reasonable value, uh, 1 to the 8, 1 to the 7, 1 to the 6, okay? Uh, what is also interesting about uh, this thing is that you can increase the parameter of the mental Lagrangian to even a very, very large value, and the performance actually doesn't degrade. So that is also interesting because uh, the mental Lagrangian actually uh, um, normally it's very hard to pick this parameter, but if you you have the guarantee that this works for a wide range of parameters, then that is good to tune uh, the parameter, okay? So now let's look at some computing times. And um, now what I want to show you here is that I'm, we're com uh, com uh, comparing IP opt against uh, the new method that we're uh, developing. Uh, this is called the augmented Lagrangian filter. Um, so what is important here is that we're comparing two things, the algorithm itself by changing the filter, but also the linear algebra. So I want to show you that these very advanced linear algebra techniques, when you're running in a computing platform, actually are very, very constrained to the point that, that they become unreliable, right? So the important uh, comparison that we're going to make is MA27 with Cholmot, which is an open source Cholesky factorization uh, uh, technique. Actually, I have this reverse. This, is, this should be sparse, and this is dense. Elipat is dense, and show mode is sparse. Um, okay. Now, the solution time. So let's look at the average time per iteration, and I'm reporting this in microseconds, right? Because uh, this thing is, uh, needs to run very, very fast. So microseconds matter here. Um, so if you run on a, on a workstation, so IP of this solving uh, per iteration is re uh, requiring over 100 microseconds, so 0.1. Uh, uh, so uh, milliseconds. Um, the augmented Lagrangian filter uh, is uh, taking one, 121 uh, microseconds. Okay, so you see that there is no benefit here. When you're running on a workstation, there's no benefit, right? Again, if MA57, uh, MA27, sorry, has all the resources in the world, has a very nice machine to solve this thing, you are not going to see the benefit of this thing. Okay. Um, now, when you solve this in, a, in an embedded platform, so what you see is that now you're starting to see some of the benefits. So the, the time per iteration for, um, uh, for IP up is 1,000 microseconds, and for the SPAR system is 800 microseconds. So you start seeing some of the improvements. But you don't see still a very nice improvement, right? So this is actually uh, almost trivial, right? The, this is not a significant departure. But what I want to show you with this table is how much time it takes IP up to solve the problem on a, on a constrained platform. So it is 1,000 microseconds compared to 100 microseconds on a workstation. So it takes 10 times more time to solve the problem on an embedded computing platform. And this is already telling you that having these constrained resources actually are, are really affecting the, the solver. All right. Now, when we move to the big problem, the one with 1,000 variables, now that's where you start seeing the, the, the big issues, right? So the, the average iteration time for IP opt for a 1,000 variable problem, which is actually not that bad, right? It takes two, uh, 22 seconds, while for the new algorithm with the reformulated linear algebra, this can be solved in 0 0.019 seconds. So again, this is just uh, just to show you that on an embedded computing platform, uh, advanced linear algebra systems are going to start getting uh, constraints. They're going to hit a bottleneck here, and they're going to be very, very expensive. Uh, there's a big overhead here. So you need to reformulate the linear algebra to uh, enable faster solutions. So with this, I'm going to finish my uh, my talk, and I'll be happy to take any questions that, uh, that you might have, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Victor. Um, so we'll just give a time for just a couple of questions. Uh, you can either put a question in the chat window, or uh, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, you can do that as well. I know we're about out of the hour, so if you need to go, that's fine too, but we'll just hang around for a few minutes and uh, answer any questions. Uh, so go ahead and unmute your microphone if you'd like to ask a question, or put it in the chat window as well. Okay, so um, I just had, uh, oh, Rodrigo, go ahead. I see you unmuted. Okay. Uh, let, okay, so I have a, I have a, uh, a question here. Uh, the, um, let's see, one of the, the 
features of IPOPT is you know, second order corrections when you're doing line searching to improve uh, the uh, you know to improve the basically the iterates the estimate of the search direction as you're uh, doing the line search. Does that does that also factor in here as well? Are you also able to include the second order correction? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, the, look, the, the second order correction is really done to accelerate the the local uh, convergence. Uh, so that can be also um, uh, implemented in the algorithm. That that should not interfere uh, uh, with the algorithm. Uh, you need to be just careful in um, in in making sure that the regularization parameter uh, is not um, uh, interfering with the decrease of the constraint violation. Because precisely what what you need to ensure in the second order correction is that you are um, uh, keep decreasing the, the constraint violation. So. But there's nothing that prevents you from incorporating that into the into the algorithm. So actually, we have tested this with second order corrections and without second order corrections, and we haven't seen any any big differences. But you just need to be careful. So here's another question: um, the uh, the compilers for ARM architectures, uh, things like you know the BeagleBone Black or Raspberry Pi, or uh, even an Arduino or you know, how are those compilers at uh, compiling some of these codes? So, so that is that is a a, a good question, uh, John. Unfortunately, I'm not such a an expert in that. So, my colleague uh, Najuan will be a better uh, person to ask those things. But uh, one of the things that that um, that I can just say is that the compiling itself I don't think it changes uh, drastically but what is important is that in a lot of these applications uh, the code has to be pre-compiled and this is uh, one uh, so this is one of the reasons why interior point solvers becomes important because uh, you need to have pre-compiled code uh, with probably static memory allocation so you cannot play around with memory and doing dynamic allocation of memory on the fly so you need to have some sort of uh, a smart way of doing a static memory allocation so that so that all the code is uh, pre-compiled and just uh, ready to go in the in the in the in the platform. So the the platforms that we have played with they use the same type of compilers that we use in traditional workstation. So I cannot say more about uh, other platforms that are, might be a little more specialized like Arduino and things like that. Um, so yeah, that that's all that I can tell you. Okay, great. Okay, so any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I, uh, Manfred, uh, first of all, thanks, Victor. It was a very interesting, nice uh, presentation. Just one comment which may be of, of interest. You know, you showed the uh, processor clock rate saturating in the graph that yep. you had. Um, it, it may be important to understand the reason. Uh, the reason for that is not that they can't do it faster. The reason is that the energy consumption of the process increases non-linearly. So that means if you have two processes at one clock rate or one process at double the clock rate, um, you use a lot more energy at twice the clock rate. So that's why why there will not be a faster process because of the energy consumption. That's that's a great comment, Manfred. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. Okay, fantastic. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, wrap it up here. Again, uh, Victor, thank you so much for the presentation. Very interesting uh, to see some of these innovations. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, several people on this uh, webinar have innovated in this space, and we're excited to see the future innovations that you'll make as well in this area. So, thanks for uh, thanks for joining everybody. And our next one, our next uh, uh, presentation is going to be on May 9th by uh, Jackie Huang. So, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks, everyone. Bye bye.